Everybody's Tyler here at Chessie Champs, checking team number 604 Quicksilver, uh, Carver Division champions this year, number one seed in that division, as well as the regional win under the belt. 604 here is an absolutely gorgeous robot and very uh, well designed and the way it functions on the field, absolutely great as well too. So we're of course gonna be talking more about that and some really cool programming aspects as well too. Help me speak more about this robot, by the way, I have Ethan, Kenji, Anushka, and Michael. And 604, really the complete package here. Some really cool stuff with the program. We'll show you with some particle filter uh, happening. All come up here on Behind the Bumpers. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. SolidWorks brings a full suite of options that are free for first teams to download, including SolidWorks Cloud CAD apps for any device with a browser, and SolidWorks for Windows, where you can connect SolidWorks to the cloud for collaborating and managing data. Get it all for free at SolidWorks.com first. Apply the skills you gained as a first student or mentor and help change the world at Stryker. Stryker is a top career choice for many of those in first because of their commitment to innovation and saving lives. Learn more about the incredible culture at Stryker and view their thousands of positions available around the world at careers.stryker.com. So let's start out on your uh, cargo path here. Let's talk about starting with your intake. We'll follow the way that through. You guys have a very uh, uh, compact, well-designed uh, robot uh, from the cargo path. Talk to me more about how you came up with this design. Yeah, so in the beginning of the build season, we were experimenting with like what our wheel positioning would be like. We ended up trying a bunch of configurations with the mechanism wheels and compliant wheels. Well, we ultimately settled on something like this with three mechanism wheels on the, the outsides, one mechanism wheel on each side on the inside to bring it into the, into the robot. And I guess some other things to highlight is we made this crash bar at the beginning of the season. It, was, it used to be like, a, like, I think it was a quarter inch plate or 3 16 inch plate. We bent it in like the first day of practice at our first regional. We're like, oh boy. So we replaced it with one by one tubing and it's been working pretty well ever since. Right. Uh, talk to me about this, uh, this drop down here and how you guys came up with using this. This just seems so efficient. Yeah, so uh, at SFR, our first regional, we actually didn't have these, these arcs. We had a, a lash design where at the beginning of Auton, the intake would just come down and it would stay out the entire match. At our first regional, we, we racked up a bunch of penalties and we found it made it kind of hard to deal with defense because we'd be racking up those penalty points. So in between our first, regional and our second regional at SVR. We had like, I think it was three weeks to come up with a new design to retract the intake. So we ended up adding an additional motor on the, this polycarbonate plate here. And the way this works is that the, these chains go to this sprocket and this belt sort of controls, like the length of the belt varies so that the, the belt rides upon the arc and it just sort of retracts that way. And we had to work along, like the packaging for this was pretty hard actually, so we had to recut this polycarbonate plate to get us some extra space for these motors. And also the mounting this was pretty, was a challenge, but we made it work by mounting on the inside of the intake here. And because of this mechanism wheel, this really doesn't interfere with our ball pass, so the ball can still go into the robot pretty smoothly. As we continue uh, through that, I noticed you guys got a couple sensors coming through. Are you doing any sort of like color sorting or anything like that too? Yeah, so we use a combination of beam brake sensors and color sensors to, uh, to index our balls and keep track of them within the robot. So if you come a little bit closer, your color sensor is right here. So this is the first thing that like when the ball comes into the robot, this is what it's gonna see first. So we get the color from here, it's red or blue. And then in com combination with these beam brake sensors, which are these yellow pieces over here, there's one here and there's one right here. So we do some logic with the code to ensure that we know which, which ball is where and which color. So we have a top cue and a bottom cue since our robot can hold two balls. So we can actually show this off right now. Yeah. So if you guys want to turn on the robot. We're red, right? Yeah. Right. We're assuming we're on the, oh, this is safe than actually. Yeah. So we're assuming that we're on the red alliance here. So let's say we get a, the blue ball, right? This is going to be the wrong color ball. It's going to hold it for strategy reasons, right? Because we want to deny the other alliance their balls. But if we pick up another blue ball, it's going to eject it. And we get two ejection points, right? We have one from the intake and one from the launcher. So if you feed the red ball in, it's going to eject the ball from the top. And once we have two correct color balls, the intake automatically goes up so we don't like accidentally keep it down, rack up penalty points, and then we're ready to shoot. I don't know if I've heard another team that has done that where they just hold one if it's the opposite alliance. I love that strategy process. Yeah, that was an early strategical decision we made in like the first couple weeks of build season. I think it's been going pretty well. Yeah. Let's go into your shooter, talk to me a little bit more what's uh, gone into that. Yeah, so this was another thing that we experimented with at the beginning of build season. We wanted to kind of minimize the complexity because we wanted to focus on other aspects of the robot. So we went with a pretty simple dual flywheel design. So we have these two rollers. They sit in opposite directions, shoots out the ball this way. And when we were prototyping, we noticed that it was kind of hard to feed two balls in consecutively really fast 
because there's a lot of, it takes a lot of like work to push the balls in succession. So we added these brass flywheels to increase our rotational inertia. And this allows us to shoot two balls pretty fast, like almost back to back. In six of four, I've seen you shooting all over the field, but do you kind of have a main sweet spot you like to shoot from? We shoot it from around the tarmac. Yeah. Where our range is not the whole field because of our fixed shooter. That's one of our design decisions, one of our trade-offs we made at the beginning of build season. But yeah. Let's get moving on. Kenji, can we talk more about your uh, climbing mechanism? What's gone into that? I just watched you play a match. Climber looks phenomenal. So talk to me about what's gone into it, and let's show a demo of it too. All right, yeah. So for our climber, I believe we should start off with the first iteration of our climber. So with our first iteration of the climber, we decided to just have a single carriage in which it would just allow our robot to push all the way up and all the way down. Right now, since it's taken off, it doesn't go all the way up anymore. But it essentially, it goes all the way up into our first, into the mid rung. And then we do what's called a double ratchet, where we will go from the high rung or the mid rung into our first set of hooks here. And then we will try to bring this bottom carriage hooks into our top stationary hooks, bring it down one more layer to our carriage hooks one more time in order to push ourselves forward and be able to do the rest of our climb. So as you can tell, that's a really complicated process. And over the after, during the off season, we wanted to simplify that process. And so this brings us to our second iteration of our climber, in which instead of having one stage, we have two stages. So a few things that you can see that we've changed here is one, the way we climb, we don't use a chain anymore. Instead, we use these Kevlar ropes. We initially wanted to use steel cables, but we realized that using a huge amount of steel cables might bring the weight up. And also these clever cables helps us to be able to make it much more flexible and it's also less dangerous to be able to use. So a few things that we should highlight that still kept onto our second iteration of our robot is one of these antennas. These antennas allow us to be able to reach onto the next rungs without having to fall down. As you can see from our competition, once the climber climbs up and is able to tilt itself, this antenna is able to hit onto the next rungs to keep us stable and allow our carriers to be able to go through and grab onto the next rungs. Yep, and then we're gonna show how this entire thing works in, the, in a bit, but as we go down onto our carriage here, Another part of it is its multi-stage mechanisms. So in our first iteration, we only had one carriage, which made us unable to bring it all the way down to our bottom stationary hooks. So this multi-stage instead is able to go all the way up and all the way down to our bottom hooks, where it helps us tilt. As you can see, right now it's turned off. Uh, let me just turn it off, Michael. So as we turn it off, it's much easier to lift it up. So it goes all the way up and then all the way down, where we're able to grab the rung up there, and it brings down first carriage, and then second carriage goes all the way down, ratchet, tilts, and we're gonna do it all over again to be able to continue our climb. So this is achieved with our pulley system here, in which we use a continuous pulley system. So we have a spool over here, and the downwards motion, since we're trying to carry the robot all the way down, our rope for that is much thicker. And for the upwards motion, which we're just trying to bring the elevator itself up to get up to the rung, the ropes are much thinner. So this continuous system of pulleys helps us to be able to go all the way up and all the way down, bring both of the carriages up and down. So I think now we should test out how this entire thing works. So as our carriage goes all the way up, it grabs onto it, it grabs onto here, and our antenna system is able to come down and bring it down here using a spring that we 3D printed and designed. And so as this first carriage goes down and brings the rung down, it flexes the antenna, allowing it to go through. Antenna resets back up there and it brings it down to the second stage. Down to the carriage, locks it here and our carriage is able to go back up and be able to climb onto our next rung. One thing that we made sure to, while doing our programming is having these angle locks so that it doesn't go onto the next stage of the climb until a certain angle is achieved. This basically makes us, our robot, prevented from falling down from the rungs, and so we're able to make a much smoother climb. So as it goes back up, grabs onto the next rung, does the entire process once again, and that's how we get onto our traversal climb.
Let's try to wrap up on your robot, talk about uh, some of the other programming that's gone into it. I know we're going to talk about some uh, uh, particle filter simulations uh, and everything else that goes into it. Uh, so uh, talk to me more about what's gone into it, Michael Anushka, and uh, how you're using, utilizing that for your team. Yeah, so first I just wanted to briefly overview the purpose of our software was to try to make driving as simple as possible. So a lot of teams have a separate driver and an operator. We have a single driver. It, it ma uh, minimizes like communication errors. And so a couple of the ways we do this are, as previously demonstrated, our ball rejection system and the fact that our climb is fully automated. You just have to press the same button over and over again. But I think what one of the most uh, useful ways that we do this is using our full field localization system. So uh, we, we know where the robot is at all times, and because of that we have an auto aim that can uh, turn and face the goal at any point e e even if it's like completely facing away from the goal um, a lot of teams aiming systems uh, re require you to be facing the goal so that you can see where it is um, because of how our localization works we know where we are even when we're not facing the goal and so um, it, aiming becomes a lot easier the robot can fully turn itself and then we also have a one button shoot on the fly uh, which means that all, all we have to do uh, again the driver just has to press one button and we can shoot while moving um, so we actually have a simulation for how our uh, particle filter in particular works, which um, Michael can talk a little bit more about the specifics about how it works. So we know our robot position on the field using odometry and vision. So by, just by using odometry, uh, it's always iterative, so there's about to be error that accumulates over time. And our particle filter has 5,000 particles, which represents the number of possible locations on the field. And as you can see, if, uh, if we move the robot on the simulation like a bunch of times you can see like the the particles are spreading out gradually right which which basically means uh, this possible every possible location of the robot could be right so this is the actual position of the robot and this is where the particle filter thinks the position of the robot is right as it's basically the same thing so to account for this we use vision uh, from the limelight with, to the hub right so once we turn it to the facing the hub the position corrects itself, and because the limelight is always can find the angle and location of the robot at all times, and it's not iterative, unlike the odometry. So, as you just saw just now, it corrected itself, and we do that every single time uh, we do a match. Um, yeah, and one thing I'd like to add is because the particle filter runs out on the driver station and not on the Robo Rio, we actually account for like network latency. So usually there's up to a second of delay. Uh, so it, the, what the particle filter thinks we are is one second behind. So we actually use real time odometry from the Robo Rio to, and we overlay it over where the particle filter thinks we are because we timestamp where, like how much the delay is. So if we have half a second of delay, then um, we'll use the odometry from the last half a second and overlay it on top of where the particle filter thought we were so we can correct for our position. So that's actually why we have uh, three different squares here. Um, so the yellow square is where the particle filter thinks we are. The red square is where the robot actually is. Of course, in real time, we won't have the robot's actual position, but in the simulation, we do. And the blue square uh, represents where the uh, where the particle filter plus the odometry thinks we are. So as you can see, it's a lot more accurate once we overlay the odometry on top of it, and there's a lot less delay. Well, 604, thank you so much for taking the time to tell us uh, about your robot. Uh, really appreciate going through this. Lots to talk about uh, on this machine that's gone into it. So of course, good luck here at Chesney Champs, and thanks a lot, and can't wait to see what you come up with in future seasons, too. Thank you. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. Stryker's commitment to medical device technology innovation has made it a top career destination for those in FIRST. FIRST alumni and mentors are given top priority in their internship and career applications. Come create the next medical innovation that saves lives at careers.stryker.com. SolidWorks brings a full suite of options that are free for FIRST teams to download, including SolidWorks Cloud CAD apps for any device with a browser, and SolidWorks for Windows where you can connect SolidWorks to the cloud for collaborating and managing data. Get it all for free at SolidWorks.com slash first. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now. And check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.